prayer is very similar to the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Now, if you took that and you could take that five minutes and we could get volunteers to go out and visit every home of every so-called, every person who lacked money but was not necessarily poor. Huge difference here. In the 19th century, we didn't, we didn't, we talked about paupers who were people who lacked the core structure and then people who were poor, which meant you had no money. Today, poor has come to mean pauper. Many people in, in history have had no money and yet they've not been poor, they've been rising. They, they, they would have money soon. Their children would have money. In fact, if you look at Little Women, it is, it is in fact a, a movie about uh, a family which has lost money but is working very hard not to lose status. And it's really very interesting that, that there's a recent New York Times essay on, on the three versions that have been made that we still have available and what they each meant in their own generation, how they reflected the values and structures of their own generation. And, and it's worth seeing Little Women and thinking about that context. And then you think about, all right, what if every person in America who told you that they couldn't make it saw that five minutes? And you said, now tell me again what your problem is. This is at the core of what we're trying to say. Yet part of it, which is totally outlawed in the, in the modern system, is if you were to say, first of all, who is so challenged they can't find personal strength? There are some people who have genetic disabilities, that they have birth problems, they have, you know, there's, they're a very tiny group. And for those people, I believe, we should all of us, through the government, generously find ways to maximize the, the third wave information revolution opportunities to improve their lives. I mean, there are lots of things you can do with computers and with technology and with rehabilitation. Those folks we ought to invest in to get them up to a point where they have a chance to lead a decent life. But they're a very tiny number of people out of 260 million. For everybody else, it seems to me, you have to start by saying you're going to have to find personal strength. Now, the problem with that and the thing which has been so driven out by the, by the elite culture in this discontinuity is that in American civilization we know that faith is central to personal strength. Let me give you some examples. These are among the great success stories of 20th century America which very seldom make page one. Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the big book, the basic text for Alcoholics Anonymous. This is what they say on uh, Forward to the first edition as it appeared in the first printing, 1939. Second paragraph. It is important that we remain anonymous because we are too few at present to handle the overwhelming number of personal appeals which may result from this publication. Being mostly business or professional folk, we could not well carry on our occupations in such an event. We would like it understood that our alcoholic work is an avocation. When writing or speaking publicly about alcoholism, we urge each of our fellowship to omit his personal name, uh, designating himself instead as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Very earnestly, we ask the press also to observe this request, for otherwise we shall be greatly handicapped. We are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. There are no fees or dues, whatever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. Totally different model. Costs no money, has no structure, and is, I think, arguably the most successful single uh, anti-alcoholism operation in the world. Second example, if you take a look at, at uh, One Day at a Time in Al-Anon, which is, uh, this is their book, Al-Anon is the, is the drug addiction parallel to, to uh, the system. They emphasize a lot uh, about the degree to which you have to confront yourself. You have to worry about yourself. This is for January 15th. They have one day at a time. Literally every day they have a little message. They say, we pray for sobriety for the alcoholic uh, because, uh, I'm sorry, we pray for sobriety for the alcoholic because we believe this will solve all of our, pro all our problems, period. This is an illusion. Sobriety is only the first step in building a good life. Unless we both work to overcome the emotional conflicts within ourselves, we remain at a standstill. Our troubles only take new forms because they did not stem from alcoholism, but from the personality flaws that caused the alcoholism. 
and from our irrational reactions to them. Even when the alcoholic has conquered the compulsion to drink, I must remember that I have much to learn about adjusting to the sober alcoholic. Today's reminder. I will, do not, I will not delude myself into thinking that sobriety is the sole goal. I will deal with each problem that comes to me with the help of the 12 steps and the loving interchange with my friends in Al-Anon. Al 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 Quote, I pray for the wisdom to take a rational and tolerant attitude toward whatever troubles I must face each day. In terms of personal strength, know how, notice how it is being driven in again and again. 24 hours a day, which is meditations, uh, which relates again back to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous as a program. Uh, this is for day one, for, for this is for January the 1st. Prayer for the day. I pray that God will guide me one day at a time in the new year. I pray that for each day, God will supply the wisdom and the strength that I need. This is central over and over. You are smaller than your problems. Only God can help you. You can get through today. We can't save the rest of your life. We can help you save today. And then tomorrow, you can get through tomorrow. So it's a very consistent one day at a time. Finally, the one of the books that made me a revolutionary. This is How Girls Can Help Their Country. I bought it at the Girl Scout House down in Savannah, Georgia, uh, where the Girl Scouts were founded, of course, uh, Juliet Lowe. Uh, and it is a wonderful book on how girls can help their country. And uh, my point to you would be that when you look through this, the common sense, the basic commitment again and again, this book was written in, published in 1913, before there was an ERA. Its emphasis on helping others. Its emphasis on strengthening yourself. Its emphasis, for example, every girl should, get two jobs, should have two trades so that if one dies, she can earn a living at the other. And you read that passage, then you think about modern unemployment compensation and the attitude of waiting. There's a, th this book is a profound statement for women of a set of values in a time when most of you probably assumed they were unliberated. But in fact, it talks about professions, it talks about patriotism, it talks about serving your country. And of course, imagine how old-fashioned the concept, how girls can help their country, not how their country can help the girls. Now, in that framework, I just want to suggest to you that voluntary school prayer matters because we are endowed by our Creator and authority comes from a supreme being. And I, I want to wrap this up because it comes right back, in a sense, to personal strength. The thing that Marvin Olasky says he found fascinating is that when you talk to the successful philanthropy groups who really help people cease to be a drug addict, cease to be an alcoholic, learn to rise from poverty, they emphasize over and over again, they start with faith. When you read the big book uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous, it starts with faith. And I'm going to come back to this later, but when you read the 12 steps, it starts with faith. Uh, when you go through item by item, it, it is a continuing again and again process of saying, if you don't dig into yourself, where do you think personal strength is going to come from? And Alaska tells a story of a very powerful mission system, I think it's in California, that was doing really well, but they, they, and they would help the local poor, they'd help the homeless, they, were, they had a tremendous 75% getting off of drug addiction. The local government loved them so much it came to them and said, we'll give you the money to triple your mission, but you have to quit this prayer stuff. And they said, we'd love the money, but it's the prayer stuff that is the reason we're successful. The average rate for secular government programs, according to Alaska, is like 8 or 10% success. They were having 75%. They said, what you're telling us is, to get the money from you, we have to quit doing everything that works, which is the reason you want to give us the money. And so my argument's very simple, and I'm, I am totally against state prayer, I'm totally against the teacher praying, but I think we've got to have a debate and a dialogue about reestablishing the right to have some level of concern for faith and spiritual being everywhere in America. And it has to be diverse, and it has to represent everybody, and it can't be in any way an establishment system. But if you start by saying, in order to solve our problems, we will not discuss faith, spirituality, or inner strength, you are saying, in fact, we're not going to solve our problems. And no matter how much money you pour into an empty vessel, if the bottom of the vessel is open, it's going to go straight through. And the whole point of this opening hour is to suggest to you that if you want a healthy, free society, it starts with personal strength, 
personal strength starts with some inner strength and inner, an inner sense of courage, inner sense of integrity, inner sense of spiritual faith. And that unless you address that, you're not going to have a healthy free society. And every government solution that precludes those, that undermines strength by giving you an excuse not to get up, that undermines family by punishing you if you get married, that sends signals that tell you these things don't matter, but why don't you come down to the bureaucracy and apply for a check, are in fact undermining the very goals that they're designed to achieve. So what we'll do in the uh, second hour is we're going to take this back up again and work our way through some examples and then discuss uh, the works of Peter Drucker at the very end. We have a, about five minutes, I think. <laughs>